Hey, folks. Welcome back to Sorry What. I'm Jason, your storyteller. Ready for today's story. Well, go grab your favorite drink, find a chill spot, and let's dive into it. After six years of marriage, Ellie and I were about to see all of our planning pay off. When we first got married, we started a strict savings plan, and now finally saved enough for a down payment on a home, and we're going to work on filling that home with children. I'm David Wallace. And I had my own business as a cybersecurity consultant, which allows me to work remotely since I didn't need an office for my business. If anyone asked me about my marriage to Ellie, I would tell them that we are deeply in love and committed to each other. Then, I would tell them how we share every secret and intimacy, and enjoy an amazing sex life and unbreakable love. Between our love for each other, our financial situation, and combined goals for children, I would have bet my life that our future was safe and secure. There were times we would watch other couples struggle and divorce, only to know our love and marriage was on different level, and nothing would ever come between us. Delusional thinking is not an intentional process, but something that convinces your soul and morphs into a belief. I was a believer. Ellie worked as a regional manager for a national technology company. The company was growing, and a new vice president was brought in from the Manhattan office. Richard Jones was a young, cocky Ivy League graduate who was one of those people who knew more than everybody else, and liked to show his power and position over his staff. That's when my belief system began to get challenged. Ever since his arrival three months ago, my wife had become cold, short-tempered, and not very nice around the house. She blamed it on stress at work, but I felt there was more to the story. I tried my best to be a good husband, being patient, bringing home flowers, trying to plan date nights to her favorite places, and tried to understand her concerns. One night, when she was upset, she told me all about her new boss. She said that Richard was a real asshole and made everyone nervous and stressed out. I told her to quit, but she said that she put in for a transfer to a different division in the company, and that we needed the money for our new home. She said that this wasn't the time to quit, and wanted to give us some more time. Ellie explained that there was a good chance the transfer would go through due to her experience with the company software, and that she was liked by the corporate office. Her current job required her to visit the other branches three times a month, and now she felt that she would only have to go on one or two more business trips before the transfer was approved. That was six weeks and three trips ago. There was no transfer, and there was increased stress at home. This turned into her treating me more like a roommate than a husband. I let her know I wasn't happy, but she said to be patient, and things would get better because Richard had been nicer to the staff. Her work colleagues thought that maybe the corporate office told him how the office morale was down, and to change his attitude. She also felt that the transfer might still happen. I could tell she was trying to be nicer at home, but she was still being short with me, not wanting to have sex more than twice a week, and even then, I felt like it was pity sex, not the love making we once shared. Friday night she came home and announced that she was going on a trip to the corporate office in California for two nights with her manager Richard Jones. She said she was going to find out about her transfer while she was there. What I didn't know at the time was that her stress was caused by the pressure Richard was putting on her to have sex with him. Ellie was a sexy 28-year-old woman, 5 foot 7, thin, with large breads and the face of an angel. Up until the last three months, Ellie never gave me a reason to worry. I learned later that when Richard started his predatory actions, she put him down, which humiliated him and hurt his ego, and that is what caused the stress she was feeling at work. Obviously, this was pure sexual harassment, and why she didn't tell me or her human resources department is beyond my understanding, and remains a mystery. After Richard realized that his methods weren't working, he switched tactics and started flirting, teasing, complimenting, and promising Ellie a great future with the company. After several lunches and many conversations about her marriage and her sexual life, he persuaded her to think about being with him just once, and what that would mean to her future. All the stress she felt, combined with her upcoming act of betrayal, created this devil woman, and apparently the way she coped with the upcoming affair, was to blame me and make me the bad guy, in order to justify her one-time cheat, and cover her guilt. We hadn't had sex or been intimate for the last two weeks, and she wasn't interested in any of my advances. I don't beg for sex, and I let her know that if things didn't change quickly, we were headed for a bad place. She promised things would be back to normal soon, and to just give her a little time to work through her issues at work. I was in love with her and wanted things back to how they were only a few months earlier, but I didn't know what to do, but knew things were going to have to change, so I let her know I would give her, until she returned from her trip to save our marriage. Our 7th anniversary was coming up, and I continued to try and get things back to normal between us, and tried to rekindle her affection before her trip, to no avail. On the afternoon that she was headed out of town, I came home early to surprise her with a box of her favorite chocolates, to take on her trip to let her know how much I loved her, and wanted our lives to get back on track. 
I knew that she took the day off to pack and was going to leave for the airport at 3 p.m. I got home at noon with a smile on my face, hoping to surprise her and tell her how much I love her. After I came into the house, I called out for her the second I walked through the front door. But to my surprise, the house was empty. I walked into the bedroom and saw her luggage on the bed and a slinky dress on a hanger. She always dressed nicely, was secure about her body, and enjoyed looking fashionable, and I always enjoyed how she looked. Standing alone in our bedroom, I called her cell to find out where she was and was greeted with short answers and a curt greeting. Hello, what do you want? She said, sounding irritated that I was calling. That hurt. After all my efforts, I felt like I was bothering her and someone she did not want to talk to. Well, that's a nice hello. I wanted to see how your day was going and what you're doing. Look, I'm out to lunch with my sister. You already know I leave for the airport at 3 o'clock. Do you need to know anything else? Shocked by her treatment, I just told her to have a nice flight and hung up without saying goodbye or saying I love you. I normally ended our call that way, and I wondered if she even noticed. I was hurt and angry, and I sat on the bed next to her rollaway bag, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. The way she talked to me and was treating me was unacceptable. My anger started to flare as I sat there, staring at my phone. I wasn't going to wait for her to come home, so I decided to get out of the house. As I stood to leave, a purple-colored item caught my eye in her open suitcase. Now, I had never snooped on my wife before, but for some reason I went into her suitcase and picked up the plastic bag that had the purple item. To my shock, I took out an unopened package that contained a sheer purple, sexy baby doll nightgown. Also in the bag were a sexy pair of thong panties and a matching purple bra, as well as an unopened pair of nylons on top of a purple garter belt. Seeing as she hasn't worn lingerie for me for the last two years, I realized that she packed this intentionally for someone else. Suddenly, everything came together. I then looked through the suitcase more carefully and found a box of rubbers in her side pouch, still in the bag from CVS. That was when everything clicked. The way she was treating me no sex, cold, and being distant. Things between us had changed ever since she started going out of town with her boss three months ago. I realized I was holding the evidence of an affair. She packed these items for her trip to show them to another man, most likely Richard. In a split second, I realized I no longer wanted to be part of her game or her cluckled. I went downstairs to my office, got a piece of paper, and wrote out a short note. Shaking in anger, I wrote, Ellie, I hope he likes your sexy lingerie. Now it's crystal clear why you've changed over the last few months. It's obvious that you don't want me anymore. Don't worry, by the time you get home, I'll be gone, and you'll never see me again. I would never have married you if I knew you were a cheating slot, but as they say, live and learn. The one good thing that came out of this, is that you'll never be the mother of my children. I'm blessed that we waited to start a family. Maybe Richard can help you in that area. David. Then I got the stapler out of my desk drawer, carefully opened the package of lingerie, and stapled the paper to her expensive and delicate material. I then placed everything neatly back in her suitcase. I made sure I didn't leave any signs that I was home, and I drove to a local restaurant to be alone and eat something to try and help my upset stomach. Early on her day of betrayal. I met my sister, Jenny, for lunch because I had to tell someone what I was about to do. Call it guilt or fear, but I knew I could trust her to be a good listener. All the stress was making me crazy, and I needed to get it off my chest before my head exploded from everything I was going through. After we ordered from the menu, I confessed everything, and felt relieved once I got it all out. I felt Jenny's anger when she looked at me as if I were crazy. Why are you jeopardizing your marriage for this asshole? In past conversations you told me he was a jerk and that he's been harassing you for the last few months. Why don't you quit or file a sexual harassment case with HR? Jenny, over the last month, I got to know him much better and he's going through a tough divorce. He's been acting out and taking his pain out on us, but he's been extremely nice over the last month. He asked me to be with him just one time and I don't know why, but I agreed. We are going to do it one time on this trip, and he promised we'd never speak of it again, and he would help get me promoted in the company. So, you're going to cheat on David, the guy you've loved since college, for what, a possible promotion? You realize he's turning you into a whore, right? No, it's not like that. I actually feel sorry for Richard, and I know he just needs this. Besides, David will never find out, and we'll get back to normal when I return. Excuse me, David's calling me, let me answer this. Hello, what do you want? David, I'm out to lunch with my sister. You already know I leave for the airport at 3 o'clock. Do you need to know anything else? Good. As I put my phone back in my purse, I was wondering why Jenny was looking at me in disgust. I turned to her and, in an angry voice, asked, what? Ellie, did you just talk to your husband like that? That was the rudest thing I've ever seen you do. 
What's going on with you? What are you talking about, Jenny? Do you even realize how you just spoke to David? Have you lost your mind? Jenny, what are you talking about? I just had a quick call, that's all. You answered the phone and said, what do you want? Do you know what my husband would do if I talked to him like that? And the way you ended the call with, do you need to know anything else? No, goodbye. No, I love you. No, I'll miss you. How do you think he feels after being talked to like that? Jenny, what is going on with you? I'm concerned about your judgment and how you've been acting. Oh God, I didn't realize I spoke like that to him. I did say that, didn't I? What was I thinking? Ellie, I think this affair you're about to have has taken a toll on your mind and is putting your marriage in danger. You've been telling me that you were tired of David complaining about how your marriage was in trouble and how you've been ignoring him. Look, it seems to me that you're sabotaging your marriage and treating your husband like crap to offset the guilt you must be feeling. Oh my god, you're right. I've been a witch, taking my problems out on poor David. I have to call him back and apologize. Do you want privacy? No, stay here. It's ringing. Damn it, he's not answering. Maybe he's busy. He always answers my calls. I'm calling again, hopefully he'll answer. He's not answering. Ellie, send him a text. Damn it, he's pissed, and now I don't blame him. And I need to leave in less than two hours. Well, sis, you better apologize and get your sheet together. I don't think what you have planned with Richard is a good idea, and you need to stop this nonsense before you screw everything up. You guys have been so good together, and you're about to start a family. Think about it Ellie. I know, you're right, but I'm not sure I can stop it now. It's just once, and my home life and work life will be good again. Richard's been having so much trouble with his divorce, and he's really depressed. He promised it would just be once, and it would help him because I remind him so much of his wife. You know he's playing you, don't you? Ellie, you can't be that blind. No, I can tell. Deep down he's a sweet guy, and his wife is trying to get full custody of his kids, and destroy him with alimony. When he opened up to me, I felt his pain, and we had a connection. I feel like I need to do this, just this once after all the time we spent together. Have you talked to him about your own marriage or how David treats you? Looking down at her hands and after a long pause, Ellie spoke in a low voice, I may have said something about David complaining, and our lack of sex. Ellie, you're an idiot, and you better pray that David never finds out you've been sharing yours and David's intimate relationship with another man. I have to tell you, Ellie, I think you've already gone too far, and if David finds out about this, your marriage is definitely in trouble. Don't you see how screwed up this is, and how you're putting everything in jeopardy? Look, I get your point, and you're right, which is why it's only going to happen this one time. I realize now how I've been treating David, and when I get back from this trip, I will make it up to him. He'll never know, and it will never happen again. I will never talk about this again, because it will never exist in my mind. It will be forgotten. You really are delusional. You're about to have sex with another man, and you believe once that happens, you're going to forget about it. I'm telling you, it will change you. It will change how you think of your husband. No good can come from this, please rethink this. Jenny, thanks for your concern, but I'm a grown woman and can handle this. I mean, it's just sex, and it's only one time. David will never know, and as they say, no harm, no foul. Well, I hope you know what you're doing, but I want you to remember what I'm saying, you're making a big mistake. Please think about it before you do something you can never take back. You will forever be a cheating wife, and I hope you can live with that. Don't worry, I'll handle this, and in two weeks you'll see a happy David, and we'll be working on starting our family. I'm sad, and I feel terrible about this, because I know this is not going to turn out well, and as your sister, I don't want you to do this. Please cancel your trip, quit your job, and apologize to David for your recent behavior. David is also my friend, and if he ever finds out I knew about this, he'll never speak to me again. Thanks Jenny, I love you and I appreciate your concern. I'll think about what you've said, but I still need to go on this trip. I'll talk to David and apologize for my bad behavior before I leave this afternoon. David's thoughts at lunch. These feelings were new and unwelcome. As I sat in the booth at our local restaurant, I started to reflect on the last few months, and how my marriage went from a state of bliss to complete sheep. I had to wipe my eyes several times to prevent anyone from seeing my weakness and pain. When I first sat down, all I felt was anger, but those feelings transformed to sadness and hurt as I felt the full impact of my loss. The woman I loved, and the marriage I lived for, are now distant memories. Then, as I considered my situation, my feelings changed to those of humiliation and betrayal. How could she do this to me and our marriage? What had I done to turn her into a cheating witch of a wife? I knew I was not going to be able to forgive her. 
I was never going to be with a woman who wanted to be with another man, my ego could never handle that. I'm aware that many of my friends have overcome an affair, and will tell me to forgive her and get over it. Well, that's not going to happen. Then suddenly my feelings of anger came back when my phone rang, and I saw Ali's number. I had no intention of taking her calls. The time for talking is over, sweetheart. Your sweet, loving husband has moved on, you have awoken a monster. Ali's flight with Richard. Richard arranged for first class seats for their long flight to the west coast, in an effort to impress Ali. However, on the plane, Richard saw that she was upset when he learned that her husband wasn't returning her calls or responding to her text messages. When she told Richard that she was having second thoughts about everything, he thought quickly and played the hurt husband angle again to get her back on track. He got her bloody Mary and convinced her to relax, and everything would be fine. Ellie, calm down. Everything is fine, and I'm sure there's a good reason for this. Perhaps he's in a meeting or just can't talk. He'll call you back, I'm sure. Besides, nothing happened, and everything is fine. After we get back from our meetings, I want you to take a few days off and spend time reconnecting with your husband. I just wish I had a wife who was as loving as you are. You know she won't even let me talk to my girls, and that hurts so bad. You're a great wife, and I know things will be fine. Ali saw a tear in the predator's eye as he talked about his girls, and once again fell for his line of crap. After the second drink, she forgot her own problems and took his hand in hers, trying to console the hurting man. That's when he knew he had her and was going to finally duck this stupid witch, and send her back to her husband with his spunk still in her kitty. He had been working too hard to let it end right near the finish line. It was all a game to him. Sending women back to their husbands full of his seed, was what he lived for. To let the wife know she gave herself to another man and lost respect for her husband at the same time. The wife would remember what they did and have that in mind when she was back with her husband. What he relished even more, was when he got to meet the husband after he had defiled his wife at a business event, or some chance meeting. When that happened, it gave him the greatest feeling of power. It was a drug, and he was hooked on these feelings, which made him feel in charge and complete. It also made him a dangerous person around these poor, foolish, and gullible women. When they arrived at the hotel, they walked to the registration desk hand in hand. Ellie was a little shocked when she realized there was only one room, and she would be spending the entire trip with him. As they left the counter, she looked up at Richard and said, I don't have a room. Ellie, we talked about this. You and I will be together for this trip and never again. Let's just enjoy this one experience as we promised each other. I thought you said it would just be one time. Richard, I'm not sure. Relax, Ellie, everything will be fine. One trip, not one time. Look, until we arrive back home, you're my girl. Just this one time. Pretend you're my wife, and I promise I'll treat you like the princess you deserve to be. Nobody will know, and it will remain our secret forever. They checked into the room, and she felt an intense rush of guilt when she saw that there was only one king-size bed. She realized that for the first time since she was married, she would be sleeping with another man, and was simultaneously overwhelmed with excitement, as the guilt faded. The mixed feelings made her dizzy and forced her to step out onto the balcony for some fresh air. Richard recognized the situation, quietly placed the bags in the closet, and joined her on the balcony overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Isn't this relaxing? I requested this room knowing that you would love the ocean view. She nodded with a tear in her eye. Yes, it's pretty. Richard turned to Ellie, placed his hand on her chin, and lifted her face to his. Looking deeply into her eyes, she gently kissed her lips. After a few seconds, Ellie returned his kiss, which turned into a hot romantic tongue-entwined passionate makeout session. Realizing what she had just done, she gently pushed him back and smiled. Richard knew he was making progress and wasn't going to push things too fast. He knew that in a few hours he would be balls deep in this stupid woman. Then he would duck her all night long, take her peach, and make her swallow several loads, all the while knowing he was defiling her as her clueless husband was miles away. He felt a wave of satisfaction sweep over him as he smiled back into her eyes. That was nice, Ali. We have dinner reservations in a couple of hours, and I know you want to get ready, so I'm going down to the gym for a quick workout, and I'll be back in time to get ready. She nodded without saying anything, and watched as Richard took his gym clothes and headed out of the room. Sitting on the bed, she needed to talk to David and make sure things were okay. Now that she realized how she had been treating him, she wanted to apologize and make sure he was okay. She loved him and just wanted this trip to end and get their lives back on track. Her heart raced when his phone started ringing, praying he would answer and tell her he loved her, but there was no answer. He wasn't answering the phone, and she knew he was pissed from her last conversation. She then sent him a text, hoping it would help the situation. The text. David, my darling, I am so sorry for how I treated you on the call today. 
I was having a bad morning, and I took it out on you. Please forgive me, and I'll make it up to you when I get home. I miss you so much, and I want you to know I love you, and can't wait to start our family this weekend. Please call me, I need to hear your voice. After a deep sigh, she stepped into the hot shower, shaved her legs and kitty, and then washed her hair. Stepping out of the shower, she admired herself in the full-length mirror, and was excited to wear the new outfit she had purchased. For the next 30 minutes, she meticulously worked on her makeup and hair. She was pleased with the dramatic evening results and how her hair looked long and spectacular. Forgetting her text to David, she was only focused on getting into her new outfit to see how sexy she looked. Soon her thoughts drifted back to David, and how she would wear the same outfit for him when she got home. Richard was in the middle of his run on the machine when Ellie went to her garment bag and took out the short black cocktail dress. This was a daring number she bought especially for this trip, which showed off her nice breadths with a daring neckline. She was going to be daring and go brawls tonight. The short skirt would make her long legs look sexy with the new high heels she also purchased for this trip. After admiring the dress for several moments, she went to get her lingerie and took out several items, including the lingerie she intended to wear for Richard that night. With everything neatly laid out on the bed, she opened the new pair of sheer black pantyhose and slid them up over her long smooth legs, over her new back thong. There was no need for a bra tonight, so she carefully stepped into the dress and then slid on her high heels. After adjusting the dress to make sure her firm, round breads were covered, she went to the full-length mirror and admired the sexy woman looking back at her. She smiled again with satisfaction knowing how hot she looked, and again thought about how her husband will enjoy taking this dress off her, and making sweet love to her when she got home. Then she looked at the clock and knew Richard would be back in a few minutes, so she started to straighten things up. She went back to the bed to move the sexy lingerie she was going to wear that night over to the closet, so that she could quickly change when they got back from their dinner date. When she picked up the bag from Victoria's Secret, she noticed it was already opened in the skew. When she looked closer, she saw a piece of paper stapled to the lingerie. The oddity puzzled her, and she became quizzical. She then removed the delicate items and saw the handwritten note that was stapled to the expensive lingerie. Still confused, she read the note and immediately became frozen with fear. Her heart stopped when she read the note, and tragically her world came crashing down. The reality of what she was doing hit her heart. She was stunned, and unable to move as she stared at the note. Then suddenly a river of tears came flooding out of her eyes as she collapsed to her knees with her head in her hands. She was now on the carpet, sobbing, and feeling an unimaginable level of hurt and pain that she was unable to comprehend. Now, in full panic mode, she called David's phone and left a voicemail in a trembling voice, David, I got your note, and darling, nothing happened. I never did anything, please forgive me, this was a stupid mistake, and I love you. Please call me and talk to me. I have to talk to you, baby. Believe me, nothing happened. Please call me. When she realized he wasn't calling her back, she left several long text messages and was now rocking back and forth on the large chair next to the bed. When Richard entered the room, he saw the train wreck and realized something was about to derail his plans. What's wrong, darling? Don't call me that. I'm not your darling, and because of you, I may have ended my marriage to the man I love. You forced me into this situation, and now he left me. Ellie, calm down. What are you talking about? Richard saw the note that Ellie was pointing to on the bed. A smile crossed his face as he read it, and he had that wonderful feeling of satisfaction once again. Ducking with the husband's head, this is what he lived for. Seducing the wife and ducking up their lives. It all went back to his childhood, when his father dumped his mother for another woman, and somehow that experience warped him in the worst possible way. In his sick mind, it didn't even matter if he got to duck her, he already had what he wanted. Taking her now would just be a bonus. So, he would let her get her crying out of the way, and then convince her that since her husband already thinks she had sex with him, they might as well do it and enjoy it. He knew it was going to be a hard sell, but this was his gift. At least he convinced himself of this, and his past experience with cheating wives made him confident in his skills. But Ellie wanted no part of this game any longer. She took off her heels and removed her dress in front of Richard, completely ignoring his presence. He was sure she was about to jump him and get what she needed his big clock. Appearing naked right in front of him made him rock hard in anticipation, as he took in her amazing boy. He stood up and took off his pants, expecting Ellie to come over and feast on his manhood. When Ellie saw what he did, she just laughed. You're ducking crazy if you think I'm ever going to touch you again. I have to get home to my husband and fix this mess that you caused. Richard became angry when he realized he wasn't getting any of that sweet kitty, and spoke out in a tone she had never heard. That I caused. You stupid witch. You're the one who agreed to this. You left your husband and agreed to have sex with me. I never forced you, and you made this choice all by yourself. 
Look at the outfit you were just wearing for our special night. It all but said, please duck me. Admit it, if you really loved your husband, you never would have agreed to being my slot for the weekend. You bustard, how dare you speak to me like that. You're just an obnoxious bully, and I want nothing to do with you. You've messed up my happy marriage, and I have no idea how to make David forgive me and take me back. Hell, if this situation were reversed, I would divorce him and make his life a living hell. I hate you and what you've done. Enraged Richard shot back, sure, it's all my fault. That kiss you gave me an hour ago tells the truth. You loved it, and you wanted more. You wanted me to duck your heart and rock your world, and you know it. Ellie looked shocked at his outburst as he continued, just admit it and stop blaming me for wanting to cheat on the man you say you love. You'll never convince me that you loved him and so easily agreed to cheat on him. You're just like all the other slots. You want some fun on the side, as long as you don't get caught. Once you get caught, you blame the man who seduced you. Well princess, you never would have let me seduce you, take you on a trip across the country, and agree to a night of sex with me, if you really loved your husband. You didn't even object to staying in the same room and sleeping with me. Yeah, you must really love your husband. I can't imagine what you would do if you didn't love the poor sap. Trust me, he's lucky to find out now that you're a cheating wife, and can't be trusted before you start having children. His words crushed her soul. She knew he was right, and that she had made the choice on her own. She was blaming him for everything, but realized she could have said no at any time. Even her sister warned her, but she made the decision to leave her husband and be with Richard. Right then, she wasn't sure what hurt more the fact that she realized that Richard was right about her, or how badly she had hurt her husband. Filled with remorse and guilt, she quickly packed her bags and went down to the lobby to see if the concierge could help her catch a red eye back home. She needed to get back home and let David know how much she loved him, and that nothing happened. After 20 minutes on the phone, there were no open seats on any of the flights back that evening. She was stuck in San Diego until the morning, when she could catch a flight home and arrive around 6 p.m. It was much too late, but without any options, she had to make the changes. Then she realized that she didn't have a room at the hotel and needed a place to sleep. The consigner, seeing how upset she was, tried to help her. She told her that she had found a room, and if she would give her the credit card, she would have the room key ready in a few minutes. After she gave her the credit card, she sat there alone, and was thinking about the three past months that David had outlined in her note. She realized that she had in fact become a distant wife, and was treating David terribly out of her guilt, taking her frustration and stress out on the dear man. When she saw the face on the concierge, she was concerned. I'm sorry Mrs. Wallace, your card was cancelled. Do you have another card? Cancelled. Oh my god, this can't be happening. Here, try this one. She realized that David cancelled their joint cards when the other two cards didn't work. She panicked and tried to figure out what she was going to do. There was no way she was going back to Richard's room, she'd rather just stay up all night and wait until morning. Without any other potion, she swallowed her pride and called her sister. Hello. Hi Jenny, sorry to bother you. That's okay, sis, what's wrong? Now crying, Ellie broke down just after Jenny answered the phone. I should have listened to you, but I didn't. David found out about my trip and put a note in my bag telling me that he's left me. I'm stuck out here and trying to get home. I'm not going to say I told you so, that would be rude. How can I help? Well, David isn't answering my calls or text messages, so he can't help me. I guess he cancelled our credit cards, and I can't get a room. Could you give them your credit card for the hotel room, and I'll pay you when I get back? Damn it Ellie, you're supposed to be the smart sister, but recently you definitely have not been very bright. Of course I'll help you. She called her sister back an hour later. Jenny, thanks for helping your idiot sister. I was able to get a room for the night. I'll catch the morning flight back home. Do you think he'll forgive me? Not sure, sis. Have you heard from him? No, but I left him several messages and told him nothing happened. Well, good luck. Just the fact that he knew what you were going to do, and you went on the trip isn't a good sign. Keep trying to reach him and beg him to forgive you if you want him back. David's nightmare. I didn't know if she went through with having sex with Richard or not, but she was obviously going to do it, and that was enough for me. She said she loved me, but went off with another guy, with plans of taking him to bed. I was not about to start a family with a woman like that, or stay married to her. I turned my phone off, moved out of the apartment the next day, and drove to Austin, Texas, where I had several jobs lined up. On Facebook I changed my status to single, and posted a photo of the cheating couple, that I created on AI, using their online photos of them walking together and holding hands, and wrote, Ellie's new love Richard Jones. She's tossed me away, and I've filed for divorce and consider our marriage over. When I checked an hour later there were dozens of comments from friends who were shocked by my revelation. 
A few of the women posted their sadness for my loss, and suggested I call them if I wanted someone to talk to. Funny, but for the first time in months I had a feeling of being wanted and realized my life wasn't over because of a cheating spouse. From some research, I discovered that Richard was not in the middle of a divorce and loved his wife and children. He just loved preying on unsuspecting women a little more. He really enjoyed defiling the wife and turning her husband into a cuckold. It gave him a feeling of power after taking the wife and knowing the husband was going to be licking the kitties he had just stopped. That was the thrill for the Sega maniac. The need for power over these women and their husbands was his addiction. Ellie was stunned into reality when she learned how Richard had lied to her about everything. She made sure his wife knew about their affair and how he chased all the women at work. There was going to be some turmoil in Richard's life in the near future. Divorce court, Mr. Wilkes, where is your client? David was supposed to attend court on the day of the divorce trial. The judge was livid when he didn't show up and asked his attorney where he was. The attorney said he didn't know, but was sure he would be here shortly. She ordered a 15-minute recess, and said if he's not here she'd hold him in contempt. Joshua Wilkes, his attorney called David's cell phone, and soon realized that David had no intention of attending the mandatory court session. He told his attorney he was stuck in traffic. When the judge came back Joshua stood up and spoke to the judge. Your honor, my client is stuck in traffic and trying desperately to get here. Well, that's too bad. I have other cases today. Your client is in contempt, and I'm setting this fine at $1,000. I reviewed the file, and I am demanding three counseling sessions before the next court date in 60 days. Tell your client that if he doesn't attend the counseling, or doesn't show up for court, I'll give him 30 days in jail and another fine. Do you understand my decision today? Yes, your honor. Joshua gave his client an earful, and told him he had better follow the judge's order. After balking at the mandatory counseling, he agreed and said he would if this would finalize the divorce counseling. This was the first time she had seen David since her stupid decision to be with Richard. She ran to him with outstretched arms, only to be pushed away and ignored. After getting herself back in control from the crying fit that caused, the counselor had started things off. Elise started the session. She told David how much she loved him, and how sorry she was and didn't realize what she was doing. She continued to explain that she never had sex, and she came back home as soon as she realized what she was doing. She cried and begged for his forgiveness. When it was his turn to speak, he led with the question. Doctor, just to be clear, you expect complete honesty from both of us, if these sessions are to have any value, correct? Yes, David, you both agreed to complete honesty, and this is a no-fault session. It's important that both of you speak freely and honestly. Thank you, doctor. Turning to Ellie and looking directly at her for the first time since she left for her trip, he felt his heart pumping faster as the heart and pain reared its ugly head once again. This is difficult for me, Ellie, and I hope you'll be honest. You say you didn't have sex with Richard, nothing happened, and I should understand and forgive your actions. Do I have that right? Tears filled her eyes as she smiled and said, Yes, David, nothing happened, and once I read your note, I realized what I was doing and ran home to you. Okay, I understand, but I know you, Ellie, and you're not the type of woman to just be with another man. I mean, you've never been a slaughter that type of woman. Would you agree? Of course not, I'm not a slot, and you know that, she said, reaching her hand out to David. He didn't take her hand as it hung out in the air until she pulled back. I know you're not Ellie, but I also know that you would never take another man to bed if you didn't have a connection or feelings for that man. You see, since I know you're not a slot, I know you had feelings for Richard, am I correct? She knew she would have to admit that she had feelings or that she was a slot and quietly said, well, yes, but I don't love him. I've only ever loved you. Yes, I loved you too Ellie. But, you see, that's the problem I'm having with this entire affair. Yes, I consider it an affair. Tell me, did you spend private time with him, eat lunch together, or drinks after work? We were together, of course. Okay, that makes sense, so I'll take that to mean yes. Truth now Ellie. Did you ever walk with him holding hands? Ellie could not look into his eyes any longer and, in a very low voice said, yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Did you hold hands? Yes, but I didn't love him. You said that, I know you didn't love him. Tell me, did you ever give him a passionate kiss? Just once, I swear. David couldn't explain what happened, but all his pain, anger, hurt, and humiliation found its escape in the form of tears. Her admission caused all his stress to come out as a river of tears. As he spoke, the tears fell from his face onto his shirt and lap. David was a big, strong guy that never cried, and when Ellie saw this, it had an impact she had not anticipated. As the tears fell, David looked directly into her eyes and calmly asked another question. 
Ellie, last question. If I had not sent that note along with the lingerie you planned to wear for your lover, would you have slept with him that night? She didn't want to answer and sat there nervously as she watched his tears continue to fall. After a moment, the doctor spoke. Ellie, it's important to get everything out now. You're in a safe place, and you should not hold back. Please answer David's question. David, I love you, and I never would intentionally hurt you, but if you hadn't stopped me with that note, I would have made the worst mistake of my life and slept with him. But you saved me, and for that I am eternally grateful. Baby, we need to stay together. Turning to the doctor, covered in tears, David spoke, Doctor, this is why I can't stay married. You see, she had full intentions of ducking him. The actual act is irrelevant, the intent is all that matters in my mind. If she would do it once, I know she would do it again given the right circumstance, and I will not live with that hanging over my head. For the rest of our years together, I would remember her intent to be with someone that she wanted more than our marriage. I'd always be wondering if she still wanted it, or if she was planning another session. No, she ended it when she got on the plane, knowing the entire time what she was about to do. For the next three weeks, David attended the required sessions, and three months later, the divorce was final, but not without constant calls and requests to stop the divorce and give her another chance. Calls from her dad, her sister, and their friends were all the same. They all told him he was a fool because she hadn't had sex with Richard. David tried to explain how he felt, but in everyone's eyes, he should forgive her mistake and reconcile their marriage. She loved me, he was being childish, and he should be a man, step up and accept her back. After getting fed up with hearing how his little ego was getting in the way of their reconciliation, he basically told each one of them to go duck themselves, and never speak to him again. After that, he took some contract jobs across the country, left town, and never looked back. Ellie still called and begged for his forgiveness, and finally he had to block her number. He thought she finally got the message. She was still young and would find another man to be with, but he hoped she learned her lesson and remained loyal in her next relationship. David's Revenge it has been almost a year since that dreadful day, but I never forgot about little Richard. Now I was working across the country with no ties to home. That's when I put my revenge plan into action. Before I left, I set up a remote link to my home internet, which gave me access to Ellie's PC. She had a habit of coming home from work, logging into her company VPN, and sending in her reports. Of course, when she was finished, she just closed the cover, thinking the system was disconnected. Before I left town, I took advantage of the lack of proper security on her laptop, and simply remotely gained access to her system, which was still connected to the company internet by VPN. You have to love lazy help desk people who care more about making their job easier than worrying about security. I make a lot of honest money that way, so I really shouldn't complain. But I digress. Then I opened her email and sent a scripted email to Richard with an embedded rootkit in the link, he was sure to open. The email he saw would be coming from Ellie, which read, Richard, check these out and let me know how I look. Not being able to resist an email like that from Ellie, he would click the link. The link would activate malware and quickly place itself on every server Richard could touch and wait for my instructions, while all he would see is an error message. He would do this a few times before he realized the link wasn't working, and would ask Ellie about it tomorrow. Just as expected, the predator clicked the link and gave me access to the company's inner sanctum. I then erased any evidence of the email coming from Ellie, and the remote access logs on her laptop, and when it checked, they would not find the email, the link, or any record of the incident. With some luck, their staff would just ignore the report and move on to other, more pressing issues. I waited a week before I started my activity. Using a VPN in multiple remote servers in 8 different countries, I installed several programs on Richard's company main server, to help me complete my work. After a few hours I had access to their more valuable files and downloaded company financials, salaries from HR, engineering designs, and projects that were going to be sent in for patent approvals. These patents would be worth millions to the company. Then I wanted to have a little fun with Richard, and through his work computer, I signed him up for several corn sites, including two that were on the deep and dark web. Having access to his life through his PC, I used his credit card and bank information. It was simple to sign him up and use his company PC without his knowledge. I set up a program to move any messages from those sites to a hidden file I created on his PC, which only I had access to. In that secret hidden file, I downloaded dozens of child corn images and videos, company diagrams, and confident engineering papers, and started my campaign for Burn Richard. Over the next month, using his company email account, I sent several documents to their top competitors from his company email account, with a note asking them when the payments would be transferred to his account. Then I made a rudimentary delete of the sent emails. 
Richard was hired for his financial background, not his technical skills. So like most novices, he would think that once the emails and files were deleted, all traces would be gone. But under any type of investigation, the evidence would be easy to find. Then, from his PC, I started sending the child pornography to sites I knew were monitored by the FBI. Over a week, I sent more than 100 images that would definitely get the FBI's attention. At the same time, I paid one of my associates to plant a USB drive filled with dozens of the child corn images in Richard's apartment. It took them less than two days to find a way in and plant the device. All part of my plan. Of course, during the entire process, I was careful to use a VPN and several remote servers and my experience in cybersecurity to erase any possible ties to myself. Ten days later, a team of six FBI agents entered Richard's office while he was in a meeting with the president of the company. The agents came in, brandishing weapons and yelling FBI nobody move, as they swarmed the office. The scene was surreal, and the entire office staff froze in fear, and watched the scene unfold as they remained frozen in place, and silent. We have an arrest warrant for Richard Jones, and complete access to your company's servers. We have knowledge of some federal crimes. You will immediately take us to your department. The president gave Richard a look of disdain as he turned and led the two FBI agents to their department. Against the president's exasperated objections, the FBI took the company's servers and all their data, leaving the company in complete shutdown. When word got out, their competitors jumped in quickly and started calling their customers. Richard single-handedly, with my help, brought the company to his knees by his misdeeds and was fired and sued by the company. Richard's federal case was highly publicized. The company he worked for was in trouble and might not survive Richard's mess. The scandal ruined the company's reputation and made Richard a national disgrace. He was found guilty of 200 counts of possession of child corn, wire fraud, company espionage, federal theft and extortion. 25 years, with a minimum of 20 for good behavior. His wife divorced him, and his children would have nothing to do with him ever again. He lost it all when he tried to cluck the wrong man. As a side note, Ellie became collateral damage after the story leaked out about her affair with Richard the pedophile. The story was published on several major national news sites. Somehow these national news sites were hacked, and the story went viral for over a week. The headlines told the story of a cheating spouse, and her relationship with the Valentine's Day pedophile, Richard Jones. The hacker gave him the nickname in the articles after he was arrested on February 14th, Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, Ellie. Ellie's photo, her address, place of work, and her divorce were all made public. She couldn't go anywhere without hearing nasty comments, and getting dirty looks. She eventually lost her job after becoming infamous for her affair with a pedophile. Her future job opportunities didn't look promising, and her dating pool would now be polluted with perverts and cheating husbands. It's funny how karma can work sometimes. Over the top. Maybe, but he stole my wife, ruined six good years of marriage, devastated his own wife, two children, his family name, and destroyed Ellie, who was once a good woman, now divorced and depressed and left in his wake. The revenge was justified. The story is far-fetched and can't happen. Au contraire, it does happen, and quite often. So be careful whose wife you're about to steal, and think twice before you cheat on your husband, because not every man is a wimp. Some of us won't accept reconciliation, or anything less than the nuclear option. So, to all you predators and cheating wives out there you've been warned. That's all for today's story, folks. Don't forget to like and subscribe before you leave and I'll see you in the next video.